Hi everyone, um, my name is Sagata and um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my work, about creativity, passion, freedom. <laughs> um, since I was a child, I wanted to create. Um, I wanted to make things, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, art wasn't really treated in my family as a, as a profession. So, and also I wasn't like a, a typical artist, like in clouds all the time. I, I liked also things to be calculated and structured. So that's why I decided that maybe the best for me would be um, to study architecture. So that would combine creativity and practicality. So I went to study architecture. And while studying architecture in Poland, I got a scholarship in uh, University of uh, Tennessee. And I went over there, and they had an amazing architecture photography class. On this stage, I was already passionate about photography. But um, this is the first time when I was able to stay there in a dark room for hours. And I was amazed how quickly you can, you can see the results of your work, especially comparing to designing uh, architectural projects. With photography, you just get an instant result of your work. Uh, so when I got back to Poland, I was taking pictures all the time, annoying my family and friends and, and taking pictures of all buildings and uh, decided to study photography as well. Like on this stage, I was on the fourth year of architecture. So I already knew a lot about composition and lighting and color. So it was very easy to study both the subjects together. Um, and when I finished uh, architecture, I had to start looking for the first job. Um, I really wanted to go back to States. I, I really liked Chicago when I had friends there. I wanted to maybe do some summer, co summer course in photography, applied for my visa, and I didn't get it. And in Poland at the time, there was no jobs for anyone, including architects or photographers. So frustrated with my own country and um, with, with my situation, I decided to go to any English-speaking country and wait for a year and then apply for a visa again. And there it was, Ireland, looking for architects. It was, um, it was booming at the time, uh, Celtic Tiger in the full swing. So uh, I got a job like over the phone and within a week I packed my stuff and I was ready to move to Ireland to my first, photog to my first architecture job. Somehow, within the same time, um, I got uh, an offer from my friend's husband uh, to take stills for his first feature movie. So he was a, a photography director uh, doing mainly documentaries. And it was his big chance. He got an offer to do feature movie, and he wanted to build his own crew. And somehow, uh, he thought that I would be good for that job. The reason for it was that when I came back from, from States, I was just taking loads of pictures and I was sending them for different competitions and doing small exhibitions in little uh, coffee shops and, and bars. So he could kind of see my pictures here and there. And also uh, there was a Biennale of uh, Architecture in Poland and they had a photography competition there, which I applied for and he applied for it as well, but I won it. So he was like, OK, that's my girl. Uh, she will be taking stills for, for my movies. And by the time he realized that I have no experience working in movies, I was so excited. I was like, OK, OK, I need to do it. So I got the job, and I called, um, I called my architecture office that, I'm sorry, I can't come over. I need to wait a month. Here's this huge opportunity. I just need to stay one more month. And then I'm moving, back to, I'm moving to Dublin, and I will be an architect. So um, it was an amazing month. I learned so much on set. It was such an adventure. I had a great time. It, it was a low budget movie. Um, people were working very hard, sharing their experience. Um, uh, everyone was very involved. The director that was here also debuted. So uh, everyone was doing their best, obviously. But they didn't have enough money to finish the project. And they, we only filmed half of it. And then after a month, I moved to Ireland. Um, based on what they filmed, they start looking for, for more money. And within the next couple of months, they contacted me again. The, and they were like, OK, we have the money. We can film the second half. 
I'm like, okay, so, uh, well, I need to take another month off and go back to Poland again and finish the movie. Uh, my boss obviously wasn't happy, but allowed me to do this. I came back to Poland, um, did more work. After a month, got back to, to Ireland again and kept working in, in uh, architecture. The movie was released, was very successful and uh, won good few awards and in the end became a Polish candidate for Oscars. So suddenly everyone was getting loads of proposals and uh, two of them, the director of photography and the director of the movie, they, they both were like, okay, we are coming with us for the next movie. And they start sending me um, uh, scripts for, for upcoming movies. And then for the next two and a half years, so it's kind of back and forth between Ireland and Poland, working in Ireland as an architect and in Poland as photographer. But after two and a half years, I just had to make my mind what to do and that actually I can do both jobs at the same time and decided to stick to photography, but actually live in Ireland. And um, the way how I wanted to combine my passion for, for architecture and the, the way how I see um, design and light and composition and also my experience from working in movies and working on sets and with people and uh, how directors are working with actors, I decided to go to fashion photography. And I transferred everything what I've learned from both architecture and, uh, and film into fashion photography. So that's, for example, one of the first, uh, photog first fashion shoots I did. And as you see, there is a big inspiration from, from movies. So this one, I was inspired by Hitchcock, for example. And I was watching this for hours and then giving this as a reference to uh, to the model, that was always very helpful while the model knew exactly what I'm expecting from her. So here, um, the inspiration was one of the uh, gangster movies um, and the mood for love. Uh, and, you know, like at the beginning, you can just use um, anything you have access to, to. For example, this picture was taken in Trocadero restaurant. So we basically asked the, um, the owner if we could shoot maybe between um, between lunch time and their dinner set, and maybe we can shoot this picture there. We use their kitchen as well to shoot <laughs> Nikita. <laughs> so the cooks weren't so impressed till the mother walked into the set and they were like, okay, okay, you can shoot it. <laughs> that's all right. Um, that's inspired by uh, Orange, Clock, Clockwork Orange. And this is basically picture taken outside Brown Thomas shopping window. And you can see probably there are some shopping bags in the background. Um, but you can use literally anything to create uh, an image. That's uh, based on the night porter. And that was taken in my uh, one bedroom apartment in my, in my bathroom. Um, and um, like, you know how one bedrooms look in Dublin. So <laughs> there was myself, my assistant, a as, uh, stylist, stylist <laughs> assistant, makeup artist, hairdresser, and two of the in two models crammed in the kitchen trying to organize the whole shoot. And then in the, in the bathroom, there was only enough space for two of them and myself squeeze under the shower, dripping water and trying to take picture from behind the curtain. Uh, in the middle of which my boyfriend came back from work, opened the door and here's like a crowd <laughs> of people like in the kitchen between hair and makeup and having coffee after coffee and just me screaming from the bathroom. He walked in and there's a girl with chain, a guy <laughs> blackout. And we're like, oh, shut the door. We're working here. Um, yeah, he, he still he, he couldn't believe that that's a serious job. So. Um, and then I, I was applying all this, I built portfolio and I was applying this to, to fashion shoots, for, to commercial shoots. So that's, that's a shoot for, for a brand. Uh, uh, it was, I think, in 2010 maybe, but here I have to give huge credit to the stylists who came up with the idea of using clothes, which they were producing in 2010, but in this 40s uh, look. So amazing stylist, very good hair and makeup artist and beautiful model who looks literally like from, from movies from 40s. Um, this is one of the projects which I just did for, for fun. And it's an important one to mention here because um, I just want to tell you one thing. Like it's whatever you do today has consequences later on in your life. So karma is a big thing which I believe in. So uh, everything matters. 
For example, this project I did just out of um, passion and wanted to uh, do something outside of the um, strict, strict rules uh, and guides, uh, gu guidelines given by, uh, by the client usually. Um, and um, together with styles and hair and makeup and, and, um, and the model, we created that photo shoot, which ended up as an exhibition. And later on, I just sent that exhibition, that, um, that set of images to different um, competitions and couple galleries. And actually, after a while, I completely forgot about this. It has never been published anywhere. It was just as an exhibition. But it, has consequen it had consequences later on in my life, years later which we'll get back to it. That's another shoot which was done in the studio. We just had an idea of uh, shooting this against with, with loads of white. We used like uh, just a white muslin as a backdrop, so you can use anything really what you have access to, and loads of flour on the floor. Um, the shoot took maybe four hours, cleaning the floor, four days. So you just have to uh, think if that's worth it. Um, Sometimes uh, I was shooting abroad, so uh, I was traveling to a few different places, and that's probably my most um, challenging and, and favorite place I went to. So that was Lapland. We were invited to Finland to this beautiful place, which hasn't been open yet at the time. They were just building igloos there, and they had this uh, beautiful complex. Each of us got like their private little cabin with little, well, three-bedroom three cabin. With, uh, with sauna and everything. And they wanted to promote that space and, and that area by doing as many photo shoots, especially fashion shoots. So they invited us over. Uh, and I was so excited. I was shooting in Lapland. This is brilliant. That's a great trip. I was all bothered with buying like warm clothes and stuff. And then my fellow photographer was like, oh, so what are you shooting on? Like, what are you using? What camera are you using? I'm like, oh. Mamiya, like I, I used to have this uh, digital uh, Mamiya medium format camera, beautiful thing, quite heavy, uh, rather better for studio use than, than external use like this, but, but amazing quality. <laughs> and he was like, oh, great. And like, do you have any special batteries or something? I'm like, no, normal batteries, why? I'm like, well, like with that temperature, like the batteries are not going to work. I'm like, oh, shit. good point. Like, I have warm shoes, but I don't have proper batteries for my camera. I check the weather. I check the how long the how if the if the uh, batteries will last within that weather. The batteries will, would last if you go under minus ten. It was minus twenty. We we're like, okay, this is not going to work. So he actually um, lended me his camera, like uh, some old Hasselblad. So I was thinking, okay, I'll be shooting an uh, analog. I won't even see the pictures. This is like the digital area where you're sending files within the next few hours or the next few days. And I need to develop those negatives and then know when I get back to Dublin if it even works. So I was just praying for better weather. And when we got there, it was just on the edge of like minus eight, minus 10. So my batteries were fine, although I, I had to keep them in my knickers all the time to make sure that they really were. Um, and then we arrived and I was like, OK, it's actually dark. It's the beginning of December. And I have like two hours of daylight. There is no <laughs> way I'd be able to do the whole shoot. So we spread it over two days, but that still gave me only four hours of shooting. So we had to do the Rocky before, which means like looking for a location with torches and figuring out where we're going to shoot it. We've managed to plan it. We, we've managed to shoot it. Um, snowing, cold, poor model. She was originally from Helsinki. She froze so badly, like as you can see in minus 10, standing in that in that um, sleeveless dress it's not easy uh, that she ended up completely swollen on one side so the next morning i woke up and the first thing i just went to her cabin and was like okay how are you feeling how you look she was like oh you're so good you're worried about it. like yeah show me your face like <laughs> can i shoot it somehow because there's no chance i will get to lapland <laughs> a new model now so she was swollen slightly on one side on the other side she looked fine i'm like okay we're, we're shooting just one side then <laughs> So we had this last image to shoot with reindeers as well. 
So we're in the middle of nowhere with the reindeer, with some people who are looking after the reindeers, but they didn't speak any English, with the translator who was on the other side trying to translate what, what those guys are saying, and me in the middle yelling at the mother so she's keeping her face only one way, <laughs> trying to communicate to the reindeer. So he's, he's kind of looking my way as well, a little bit rather than turning around. Snowing all over, her hair was falling everywhere. I couldn't see through the camera if, I, if anything is in focus. And then I could see like all those people on the side, like just waving at me. I was like, what? And then the translator like waving us like, can someone just say something? Because like I'm shooting, I can't hear anything. I'm just screaming as loud as possible. Finally, I took this one picture. I didn't even know if, if it happened or not. Got to the translator, like what's going on? Why are you all like waving? It's like, you can't make noise with the reindeers. Like they're very sensitive. They're getting very aggressive when you're scared. And like, oh, OK, OK. So we survived that trip. Um, and on the way back to Dublin, we had like seven hours in Helsinki. So I was able to go through my files and just check if I definitely have the shot. And then I realized that somehow I swapped the settings on the camera and I have only JPEGs. I don't have raw images. And if you know much about raw images, you know that I could still save the image if it was underexposed or overexposed or the color setting would be different. I had only JPEGs. Lucky enough, I had high resolution JPEGs because it was from, from the medium format camera, but still only JPEGs. And that was the only picture which was sharp, where the model was looking the right way, where there was no hair in her face, where the reindeer was cooperating somehow. And we're, we're just, just lucky. So sometimes it just you can go all the way to Lapland and come back with nothing or just one JPEG, which is, which is still good <laughs> enough. So like obviously the client doesn't know the backstory, story and, and he was delighted. He wanted to see some others. So I'm like, no, no, that's the best one. <laughs> but you don't want any other one. Um, or you can just go to Sandymount Beach and just shoot it easily, <laughs> not make too much hassle or order a backdrop from a Chinese website. It will take you maybe three to five weeks, but it costs you like $10. Um, that's one of an example of shooting um, uh, jewelry with slightly different approach. Or sometimes I was going back to analog cameras and just to get a different feel for, for the pictures, just to, to break the, the usual way of shooting. Uh, to find new inspiration. So this is something what comes straight from the camera. It's not uh, digitally processed, um, retouched in any way, but it has this beautiful vibe, this beautiful touchiness. <coughs> As you've seen, I've been shooting loads of things outdoors, but also I was shooting uh, loads of indoors. And these are um, pictures which were taken uh, mostly thanks to amazing creativity of hair and makeup artists. So sometimes it's your idea, sometimes it's a stylist idea, but then you have to listen as well. Uh, hair and makeup artists who are, these are their ideas to come with and we built around them. So um, that was also amazing. And here is one of the shoots which we did after working hours when we finished um, a job for the client and Yomiko, our model, uh, was happy to stay with us and the stylist wanted just to play with the with the idea of the puppet. Um, the makeup artist had the idea of the black heavy lipstick. So we just did the shoot for no reason really, just for ourselves outside working hours. Took us like literally maybe two hours the most. It has been published later on in a few different publications, so, so that was good. But then again, it's important to remember now that particular image, which again has served me later on uh, with other projects. Um, here are just examples of um, situations when you don't really feel like shooting outdoors or you don't really have a studio. I was shooting this, I was actually shooting this uh, in the studio, but you can shoot it against the white wall. Um, and then I was taking pictures of the fabric. Let's say here is the, uh, the backdrop is the picture of the fabric of the skirt. And then in the other case, it's the picture of the bag and the, um, uh, and the jumper and just mixed up in Photoshop. So you can play like this, sometimes not even leave in your, your room. Here's again, similar example. And then 
I got back every now and I get get back every now and again to my inspiration in architecture and just go back to those black and white strong uh, structure images and play with layout as well. Um, sometimes I'm mixing pictures which are not coming from the same shoot. So here's a fashion shoot, but then uh, the plants, there are pictures from Peru, uh, from outside my little cabin, which I, uh, which I took like a year later and then mixed up the images together and they work perfect as a layout. So it's amazing when you can build the library of your, of your pictures and then keep going back to them and rediscovering them. So, uh, and just play with, with different with different options. Sometimes the picture, which is maybe not perfect at the beginning, you can play with it, cut it out, mix it up with something else and, and create something completely new. So uh, that's about my photography and how I got into it. Um, as a fashion photographer, I have, I have, been, pub I have, been, pub have been published in uh, many different magazines, um, and other publications, but it's not that I wanted always to be a fashion photographer. I just wanted to create just what I said at the very beginning. So, uh, and I really like working with people as well. So I kind of thought that, okay, fashion photography, it's my way, but it, it was still lacking of something. And also I was missing an island that there was no platform for fine art photography. So even if I would like to go more into art photography, there is no platform where I could show my work. There was no publication like this. So then um, with a couple other enthusiasts, I was like, okay, let's set up Blow Photo, which will be a platform to promote uh, fine art photography through exhibitions, performance, uh, exhibitions, talks, uh, workshops, maybe residences sometime, uh, and publications. And we started with the most difficult task, so producing a publication. Um, in 2010, we started Blow Photo Magazine. Um, I wanted to make it big, uh, a quality paper. My frustration about being published in different fashion magazines was that I was spending hours trying to fix the colors and make sure that, oh, if it's too bright or, or too dark or this or that. And then I was seeing the printed version. I was like, no one really cared. It's cropped, it's moved, it's so I was frustrated about this. So I wanted to create a platform where uh, a publisher really takes care about the, the artist's work. And that's why we started uh, Blow Photo Magazine. We decided to go big, so we decided to go with A3 format. And for the cover, I used Yomiko's uh, image. So the picture which was taken just by a chance a uh, couple of years before. Um, as a side project. Um, and then going back to those pictures, maybe I will quickly go back to those ones. You remember I was taking pictures which I sent to different uh, galleries and couple um, competitions, this one. Maybe a year after this, after this shoot, I got, uh, I got an email from a gallery in Santa Fe and they were organizing an exhibition, gathering a few different photographers from around the world, and they asked me if they could exhibit my work. And I was like, wow, how did you even find me? I don't know if this gallery exists. I checked them online. Yeah, yeah, it does exist. Okay, I will send it over. I had so many other things going on at the time that I posted over, haven't heard back from them for months, and then finally got like a catalog. I looked through, yeah, looks good. Okay, it, it did happen, but I didn't make much out of it. Um, when I started Blow, I was thinking it would be amazing to have international photographers well established, so then we can uh, promote next to their names more those who are emerging, um, and this way uh, bring their career um, and give them better opportunity um, to, and better exposure. So I dig out that, ca that catalog and I went through the names and on that stage I was much more uh, aware of photography work. I was like, wait a second, these are famous photographers. So how come I got there? And then I was like, oh, there's Roger Ballen. He was like my hero. Maybe I will just contact them and see if, if they would like to participate in this project. 
So I emailed all of them, introduced myself, saying I'm a fellow photographer. We've been together at this exhibition. I'm starting a new project. Would you be able to um, um, collaborate with me? And we'll do an interview and I would publish your work. I have no money, but uh, it would be amazing if you could help me out. And they all came back with yes. And it was amazing because we uh, we've started this. We launched it in 2010. We got really good photographers on board. This is our, that's the, that's the dish. So we went big. <laughs> um, we, we went to loads of different festivals all over the world, um, promoting the magazine, promoting different photographers, uh, promoting their work. Uh, within the first year, we were, no, we got uh, best print of the, of the year in Ireland. And then the next year, we got an email from uh, Lucy Foundation in New York that we were nominated um, in the uh, best magazine category in New York, uh, which is Lucy Awards. It's like Oscars in photography. So firstly, when I've read the email, I'm like, no, oh, this is a stupid scum. Like, no, I'm not even reading this. And then I've then only because other publications like Aperture or British Journal of Photography these are magazines which are on the market from like 50 to 100 years. Like they're amazing. They're just, I'm collecting their work. And they were announcing that they were shortlisted and there were five other shortlisted among them uh, blow. So we went to New York uh, and it was an amazing experience to be in Carnegie Hall for, for this big Oscars um, ceremony. Uh, we didn't win. Uh, we were nominated three times in a row the next year and the next year. So on some stage it was like, here we go again. We're, <laughs> we're again in New York. <laughs> um, but what I discovered then, and that was a great satisfaction for me, when I was sitting there in the audience in the first row and all the nominees are sitting, I was thinking, wow, I can't wait to go back to Dublin and work on the next issue because I already have these ideas and I already met so many interesting people here which gave me inspiration. I don't care if we win or not. It would be amazing, obviously, if we won. <laughs> but I just felt so happy that I'm still honest with, with the project. Why are we doing this? Um, and we kept going over the years, discovering different photographers. And you see, like my background was fashion photography, everything beautiful. And suddenly I came across like people who were dealing with photography in completely different ways. So self-portrait and dealing with body issues or still photography where the photographer hasn't been using even a camera. This is, these are scanned uh, pictures. So she was using a large scanner and just placing uh, uh, plants on it. So she hasn't even camera. Um, then uh, montages, use, collages using uh, pictures or, or uh, images which don't belong to you and still creating a beautiful image. Um, dealing with different teams like um, family. Here is amazing uh, Philip Toledano and telling his story about his um, encounter with his first baby, this creature coming out of nowhere and how he photographed his family life or a photographer who was dealing with depression and addiction uh, and how photography was uh, just a healing process for him, a life savior. A uh, completely different approach to fashion and to, and to beauty and actually comment on that. Um, how the artist was dealing with her trauma from car accident. Uh, uh, our identity, who, who we are when the artist was using uh, portraits of her parents and mixing it together and trying to find her own identity in this. Or just random things like we've decided to have an um, uh, animal issue and when my uh, co-editor Monika Kmielarz, who is a talented uh, editor and, and great researcher, when she said like, okay, let's do animal issue. And I was thinking, oh, I don't want to do national geographic thing. No, oh, I, can, I can't see it. It's like, no, 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 it's going to be different. And she managed to find like, again, amazing way of taking pictures of animals. So it was a great adventure. Um, so far we published uh, 17 issues. Unfortunately, we stopped publishing two years ago and now we're working on a new project, which is um, Blow Photo Book Program Fuse. So now we're running residency programs for 
for artists who want to publish their own books. So we, we just uh, walk them through the whole process of designing and publishing and how to get to the market. Um, uh, and that's, again, when I'm looking back at, at this, I'm like, OK, so am I a photographer or who am I? So I, I really don't like that labels. And it's, it just feels that it doesn't matter what you do if you keep your creativity going. You're just an artist, like each of us is an artist in, in, in its own sense. Um, there's the last project which I wanted to tell you about. It's my home. It's a place which started years ago. So as you've seen, like loads of pictures were taken outdoors, but some of them were taken as well in the studio. So on some stage, I, I was looking for a studio for myself. I had a small one, but uh, very quickly I needed something bigger. Um, and I found that building. As an architect, I was able to see through the dust and um, the mess in it that what kind of possibilities we have there. It's an old factory. It was a derelict factory. Uh, this is how it looked like after cleaning the building. And I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. This is going to be a beautiful studio. So that's my time. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful studio space uh, for uh, exhibitions, performances, workshops, everything. I was thinking like this is way too big just for, for one person, so I will be inviting loads of other people. Like, it's, it's going to be amazing. So I got an investor who was like, yeah, let's do it. I'll give you the money or give me ideas. I'm like, um, maybe let's do 50-50 because I wasn't too sure about getting someone on board who will be later on hanging over me with, with this power of uh, money power. And that was 2008. So he, bring, he was a developer. He brought his builders. His, we set up a company. We started renovating the place. And that was 2008. And within two months, he sent me a message. Uh, sorry, I changed my mind. And he pulled out all the money from the account. Recession hit. And I was left in that building halfway in the renovation with no paid bills, uh, all money gone. I was like, shit, this, is, this doesn't look good, but I really want this to make happen. And in, you know, like when I was starting this project, I invited a few people over just to show them around and say, like, what great idea I have. And they were like, no, not really. But then there were maybe one or two who were like, yeah, actually, I can see it. I can help you out with it if you need any help with the opening night or things like this. So I already had things set in motion. And there were already people working on the opening night for that studio, which was in the middle of the uh, of renovation. Um, so I called every single of my friends, asking them not for money, because I knew that most of them are uh, going through a horrible time of being fired from their jobs, but if they have any idea where I could get possibly money from. And someone finally was like, oh, maybe you should try Enterprise Board. So I walked in, explained them about the project, and they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds interesting. We have this application process. You can apply. You have a week. There is a grant available for renovation. We just need uh, just just the basic information, like a business plan, financial projections, this, 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 the whole list of things. I'm like, business plan, financial projection? I've never done this in my life. So I got back home and trying to figure it out how to do it. In the meantime, all my friends got back to me, and they were like, listen, we can't help you financially, but if you need anyone to clean the place or to wash things or paint something. Within a couple of weeks, I had this place full of random people because they were friends of friends all losing their jobs but feeling like that they at least have some purpose so they were coming over building stuff together uh, sometimes coming with their own paint or own buckets and brushes and and i was just walking around and like there was a group of spanish people for example who were surf coaching and and that friend brought them over just to okay you clean up that wall and then there was someone else cleaning something else um, and, and then one day I was uh, in the lift in my, uh, going in my, to my apartment and I met my neighbors who I've never met before. And they were living on the same floor. We live on the fourth floor. And they, the usual thing, oh yeah, how are you? They were like, yeah, great. And how are you? I'm like, oh, I'm not great. It's a disaster. So I had like elevator pitch, four floors to explain <laughs> like, this is the space, the studio, and to write the business plan and the financial projections. I just have no clue what to do. 
Uh, and by the end, like the door opened and they were like, well, actually, I'm writing uh, business plans for companies. And I'm and the girl is like, yeah, I'm doing marketing. We can help you out. We can write it for you. I'm like, really? Seriously? We can, can we do it within a week so I can apply for the grant? And it happened. They helped me out. People painted the place. And uh, a few months later, we op opened up Delight Studios. And within the open day, I already had what I wanted from that place. So people coming together, coming up with ideas, making friends. Um, uh, some of them fall in love and got married. Uh, some of them came up with amazing projects together, uh, setting up like um, modern dance theater or things like this. So we've used the space for loads of different things, including weddings. Uh, different events, um, concerts, uh, exhibitions. Uh, that's, for example, Hosier doing the gig for Amnesty International. Like that was another moment where, um, where I was thinking. Like that was only like a couple of years ago, when I was thinking, like, wow, that's exactly what I wanted from that place. Just people coming together and doing something for greater good. So then again, when I step back, like, is that photography or what is it? It's, it's not really. It's just creating things. Um, so creativity, that's, that's for me, that's the key. That's the most important thing. Just keep inspiring yourself <laughs> by uh, meeting different people, by reading different things, by traveling, by trying different stuff. Never be afraid of failure because just, just keep trying. Every failure is, is just a lesson. And for that reason, we've set up a meeting point. So uh, this is a new uh, thing which we're working on now. So it's a, it's a, a hub gathering creatives, um, professionals, um, uh, companies, uh, artists, uh, community, just to get together and share their ideas, share their passion for life, learn new things, uh, take part in some workshops or exhibitions or talks. Um, so if you'd like to check more about Delight or uh, Meeting Point, Blow or, or Diffuse program, you can, you can check it on those websites. Um, and that's all from my, from my end. I certainly invite you to, to get into Meeting Point and, and meet other people, get inspired by them. That's the, that's the place where um, over the years I've learned so much through uh, through what I've been doing, through personal disasters and um, and personal achievements as well, and learning from different sources. Some uh, some were successful, some were less successful. Uh, but I have the this huge library of tools which I would like to share with other people. And on the way, I met as well other people who have as well those libraries. I would like to learn from them. So that's as well from my perspective. It's something what I can learn also. So I certainly invite you to take part in this. Is if it's uh, just online, you can become just a member, or if you can come along, or you can bring your own idea. But certainly stay creative, have fun, enjoy life. Uh, don't get too serious about stuff, because it, it, just go for it. Like none of these things I knew what I was doing, really. I was just trying things, and, and they just happened. Uh, thanks to believing in this, thanks to being bold, and thanks to working with other people, collaborating and sharing this. Don't take ownership over this, like nothing belongs to you. Just, just let go and have fun with life. Thank you. Before going to Q&A session, uh, I would like to ask you one question. So uh, it's always interesting and great to hear someone's personal story. In uh, your case, um, so you had different situations uh, with the challenges, with some, you know, like uh, uncertainty. But uh, in the end, like now, you are quite successful, one of the most famous uh, portrait and fashion photographers here in Ireland, and you are quite successful as a businesswoman. For those uh, creative people who are like photographers, artists, uh, 
um, designers, what would you recommend to learn, to do, to develop, which type of skills, for your opinion, could be useful to develop in the beginning when you have those, you know, like creative ideas, ideas about some projects, but you also would like to find the kind of balance between creativity and profitability, how to make it successful from the business perspective? Well, I, that's that's a little bit wrong question for me <laughs> because I've never thought about like uh, how profitable that will be. So when I when I quit architecture and moved to photography, my parents were like, "Can you apologize your boss and go back to <laughs> architecture, maybe? Because <laughs> how are you going to make money?" Like for me, was the, the most important thing was that I will be doing what I love and that I can that that's my passion and that I can put hundred percent into it and that I will find a way to make money on it. Uh, that's why I chose uh, fashion photography because it has this commercial aspect. Um, but if you're starting out, you have to build portfolio and you have to invest in yourself. And I know it's a difficult time because you're kind of doing stuff for nothing and, and uh, you're offering your services for free. But it's necessary to build to build portfolio and to to build your experience and keep collaborating with people. And one of the biggest mistakes I feel that we're making at the beginning is that we're becoming a little bit too um, arrogant, like when we think, OK, I've already did so many shoots and now I want to be paid, so I'm not going to do anything for free. Yeah, I'm not encouraging anyone to do stuff for free, but if there is a project which has, like if, if someone, let's say, let's say it's fashion photography, let's say it's, it's a fashion designer which has an amazing project, but they don't have money for it. Just go for it and do your best because they will be doing their best as well to promote it. And you will be working with docents who believe in this project. And one day that will come back to you. So collaborations, that's that's big part, I think. And then on some stage, um, when you get a little bit um, better and you start getting your clients, educate your clients as well and, and try to stick to your to your values. So not necessarily take all the jobs. It's again, it's it's difficult, especially when there was recession. We were taking all the jobs which were coming our way. Uh, but like I've learned with Delight, for example, on some stage we've decided, okay, we're just taking those projects and those clients who um, go with the same ethos as, as we do, and that has served out very well because suddenly they were spreading the information around their peers and they were coming to us. So yeah, I think like collaboration and just giving hundred percent. And and uh, doing with passion what you do and actually investing in yourself. If you don't invest in yourself, who else will invest? So it's like the more you're creative, the more you're successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just just keep working, keep working, keep doing this stuff. If you if that's your passion, then you won't mind to spend hours on it. So how did you meet your uh, partners on various shoots, like stylists and so on? So uh, did you m meet or like randomly or? Um, well, at the beginning, I was literally just asking around and if if um, if anyone knew anyone. So basically, just a network of friends. But that was before Facebook. So now I'd probably just post it on Facebook. Uh, later on, when I was going, uh, when I was represented by agency, uh, I was very happy to meet anyone new who was coming to the agency and just give it a go and see how it works. I didn't want it to be stuck with just one stylist and one make makeup artist. So I was trying different things and working with different people. Um, and it always worked well because uh, then you're being recommended by them as well to clients. So building that network, it's critical, not being just stuck in your one or two people world. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask two questions. Just um, so the first one is, can you speak a little bit about the equipment that you use? So mm -hmm. both for shooting and for post-production? Because you mentioned some medium format, analog, digital. So what do yeah. you prefer? You know, if you had to like maybe stick to just one lens, one body, what would you pick? You know, okay. if there was a limit. Um, well, so I started with Canon and now I collected like a huge range of um, really good lenses and then I had beautiful medium format Mamiya digital, so I, I loved that. And then one day studio was rocked and all the equipment was gone. So I was left with iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But um, on the happy side of the story, I always wanted to go traveling. And because insurance took like nine months, that has allowed me to, to go traveling because I, I was just backpacking. I couldn't take any, any jobs or anything like this. So whatever happens, you can turn it around and do something else with it. Um, so then I swapped to Nikon. Nikon and Canon is just one is better for one people, the other for the other. Like now I probably would go back again to Canon, but that's only because my personal preference is out of focus needs to be good. My, I'm practically blind, like I can't see straight. So, um, so I need to count on, on the equipment. So I would, these days, I would choose probably Canon for that reason. But uh, probably next year, Nikon will follow up with better focus again. If I would stick to just one camera, I would go with uh, either Canon or Nikon. It's fine, but I would, I would probably go. My favorite lens is 50 mil lens. That's good for learning composition because you, it's not zoom. You have to, you have to just be very aware of what you're doing. And in digital era, we, we just shoot like million pictures and then choose one it's better it's better sometimes even to try with analog camera where you cannot see the results just to learn to be mindful about what you're doing like to be in the moment and pay focus pay attention um so you know like if you don't want to go in an, into analog in the whole process which is beautiful and i highly recommend it just just get a 50 mil lens just to learn that stillness as also depends on type of photography you're into, but like I, I would recommend the 50 mm lens, and then have the other one just for for traveling and having fun. Zoom lens 28 to like 80 or something like this, um, just to give you the range. And I would definitely recommend to have bright lenses. So 2.8 f-stop that would be the darkest I would go with. Well, thank you. And the second question is, uh, what do you think about social media and its effect on photography? Because I heard a lot from my friends who are photographers, filmmakers, that some of the things like Instagram and people feeling like you can be a photographer so easily, it's sort of devaluing it. Like some people feel that if you took a portrait of them, they own it. You know, so the, the whole idea of a photographer is changing. Well, how do yeah. you feel about it? About it? Yeah, well, like, yeah, that's true. Like this years, like these days, everyone can be photographer. And and with all the filters we have on iPhones, like when I travel, like I, I stop bringing my camera with me. I have iPhone and I just take pictures with iPhone. So that that's so easy. But then the to be in the digital space, I don't know, like I, I, I canceled my website, like I think two or three years ago. Uh, because it's like, oh yeah, I will rebuild it. And it's been three years ago. I still cannot get into that point. Um, mostly because like I would be getting work more from word of mouth. And, and then from, I don't know, it's still visible somewhere online through, through Facebook or Instagram. Um, it's a very helpful tool. And, on, and in fairness, like when we're looking for um, emerging photographers for Blow, Many of them we found through uh, through Instagram, um, but it's yeah that's that's a tricky one because I feel like photography is changing so much because of social media and you kind of have to adopt rather than go against this and use it in your advantage and use it as a tool. Um, it's like when digital uh, cameras. Uh, came out and everyone was like, no, that's not real photography. Like analog photography, it's a real photography. But really, like, as I was sh showing you from, from Blow Photo, like you can, you can use, you don't need to use even a camera to, to take a picture or you can use someone else's pictures and that, that's another thing. But as soon as you start, as soon as you cut the picture, that's already not that person picture. You already created something. So that's copyrights, that's another issue here. Um, but I think just embrace it because there's no point to fight with it. So that'd be my, I, I have Instagram. I, I hardly ever post there anything. Like I'm, I'm just so allergic to social media, but at the same time, um, like delight is always on social media. Blow is always on social media. I know we need it. I know it's the best way to communicate with people at the moment. And that's why as well we started Meeting Point that 
it's a digital platform, but with physical space in, in delight. So we definitely will use Facebook, Instagram, and all the social media in our advantage for people to connect, but we want them as well physically to meet up. Thank you. Thank you.